When I was a kid, 12, 13 years old, I heard about this story, the Darien Breakthrough, the idea that people could take four-wheel drives and venture into uh, remote, uncharted territory in ordinary vehicles. And the Range Rover project that now I'm presenting on the channel is, yes, it is hugely self-indulgent, and it is a trip down a memory lane. And so I'm about to get on a plane, go and see my car for the first time, rebuild it, prepare it for the three and a half thousand kilometer drive from the east of the country to the, my home in Western Australia. And quite a few, and actually a surprising number of people on the internet have said, why don't you just put it on a trailer? I'm Andrew Cynthia White. Join me as I share my passion for building four-wheel drive trucks and traveling to the remotest parts of the world. If you enjoy this video, please subscribe and remember to hit that notifications bell to make sure you catch our weekly videos. I only have one response to that. What is the point of that? This is not about Western Australia. <clears throat> this, is, this is about getting it to Western Australia. That's what the story is. That's what the adventure is. Life is an adventure. Life is a journey. We know the destination. Life is not arriving at a destination. Everything we do in life is temporary in nature. Everything. And so the, the enjoyment, the excitement, the inspiration, the joy of life is the journey. It's the journey, not the destination. Because the destination is gone in a flash. And we all know our personal destination, all right? And when I was a kid and I first heard about this story, it woke, an, it woke a, it, it, something inside me that I dedicated my life to. I have spent now over 45 years just immersed in the four-wheel drive industry. I've made it my career, as many of you know, and many of you will know my background. And so what I'd like to present on the channel today is the story of the Darien Breakthrough. It was a film production financed by uh, British Leyland, building the Range Rover then. The vehicles used were the very first version. They were suffix A Range Rovers. Well, this is the actual vehicle, the British Motor Museum near Birmingham. battered. Now this bracket was there was a there was an exhaust pipe that ran all the way down here down here and connected onto this exhaust pipe here. That's been re been replaced but that's the bracket from the original exhaust pipe and these aluminium ladders could actually take a, a uh, the weight of a fully loaded Range Rover and they were used for crossing rivers and launching onto rafts and uh, Man, they're battered. It's a, it's a wreck. The video I'm now going to present is, does not belong to me. I also do not have permission to make it public and put it on YouTube. But I have tried very hard to find the owners of this uh, production and I've been unable to do so. So there is a chance that I might get a copyright strike. I shall not monetize the video. Any advertisements you see on this video, that's YouTube. That's not me. I won't earn a cent. That's not the purpose of putting this video up. 
purpose of putting this video up is that it's a remarkable story. And I still think today of all the motoring manufacturers, the only one with a four wheel drive, with their roots in four wheel drive, that have actually taken the subject and presented fantastic adventure programs. This is one of them. This was the first one I could find. Think of Camel Trophy. There have been a few other attempts by other manufacturers, but none on the scale that Land Rover did it. And when Land Rover Trophy became the G4 challenge, it just became, you know, it just, uh, to me, I just lost interest in it completely. The, the brand alone wasn't enough to keep me interested. It was what they were doing with the vehicles that captured my attention and captured my and inspired me. And so this to me is the ultimate in taking an ordinary vehicle and pushing it to the absolute limits. Watch it, watch it to the end. It is a possibility that this video will be, have to be taken down because if there is a copyright strike, I will do the right thing and I will remove this entire video from YouTube. So while it lasts, enjoy it. The main north-south trunk of the Pan American Highway is the longest continuous road in the world or would be if it were not for El Tapón, the stopper as it's locally called. In 1971, the United States voted $100 million as a first contribution to building a road through the Darien Gap. The obstacles are enormous. The rainforest is dense, hilly, unbroken by ravines. The swamp at the southern end is almost liquid, and the climate is abominable. In the past 20 years, two major vehicle expeditions had tried to drive through. Both failed. December the 3rd, 1971. An RAF Hercules landed two Range Rovers at Anchorage, Alaska, with driving teams from the British Army. Their aim? To be the first vehicles to drive from Alaska to Cape Horn through the Darien Gap. With them, Tim Nicholson, author and publisher, whose dream this had been for five years. Driving down through the North American continent, 8,000 miles in 40 days, they reached Panama to join a third major expedition which would attempt to break through the gap under the leadership of Major John Blashford Snell of the Royal Engineers. It had required 18 months intensive planning under the sponsorship of the Ministry of Defence to mount this expedition and to select the personnel, 64 in all, including a number of scientists who would study the area. We found on arrival in Panama that an enemy who should have retreated by now was waiting for us in strength. Rain. Usually the rainy season finishes in mid-December. This year of all years, it hung around till mid-January. But we couldn't wait. We had only three months to cut our way through the gap before the April rains would make the Atrato swamp impassable. Our army beaver flown out in another RAF Hercules and quickly reassembled by our Army Air Corps team. Flew us from an airstrip near the gap for our first reconnaissance. As the early morning cloud dissipated, we had our first view of the jungle. It looked at first oddly innocuous. But descending to 400 feet, we realized that the tall trees must be 150 feet high, rising out of a secondary jungle which seemed almost solid. The main body of the expedition reached the end of the highway to assemble at Canitas. The first major obstacle would be the river Bayano, which is unbridged. The reconnaissance section, working with the Beaver aircraft, had found a possible crossing place, and the main body set out on January the 19th. The late rains had turned the tracks through the jungle into watery mud, and it took three days of marching in terrible conditions of heat and humidity to reach the river. From the start, John Blashford Snell had been concerned about the problem of crossing the Bayano River. 150 yards wide, it flows between jungle-covered banks at over four knots. 
for this and later crossings, he'd asked the Avon Company, working with the Royal Engineers, to design and build a special raft, buoyant and strong enough to carry a fully laden Range Rover and compact enough to be carried in it. They'd produced the Avon M650 raft. Major Keith Morgan Jones of the Royal Army Veterinary Corps, in charge of animal transport, had found it impossible to buy mules or donkeys in Panama. So he'd acquired 28 pack ponies, much less sturdy and amenable animals. He was going to make a scientific study of their performance in these conditions. The raft was proving a great success, and in three hours, the sappers got men, women, vehicles and horses safely to the other side. The Range Rovers drove along a short track, ending soon in a wall of jungle. The expedition was strung out in a long column. Captain David Brumhead's reconnaissance section cut their way through the jungle about 10 miles ahead of us, navigating as best they could by compass and aided by Indian guides. They kept in radio contact with the headquarters section and sent back sketch maps of the terrain. An advanced section of sappers followed, marking and widening the trail under the leadership of Captain Ernie Dury, R.E. Because mules had been unobtainable, their gear was at first carried on a hillbilly, a motorized track vehicle. But the mud caked on its tracks, gluing them up till they often jammed solid, so it was soon abandoned in favor of ponies. Another section of engineers moved with the Range Rovers, preparing a 10-foot wide track for them, helping to winch and push them when necessary. The Range Rovers, from which the snows of Alaska had so recently melted, were moving now at an average of two and a half miles a day, in a temperature of 90 to 100 in the jungle shade and 85% humidity. The headquarters group took up the rear at this stage, carrying rations, petrol and equipment. Caring for the ponies with the sappers were Rosemary Alhusen and Carolyn Oxton. John Blashford Snell's pith helmet bobbed up in every section of the expedition as he moved about by air, river or magic, or just by walking for miles through the jungle. The rains were still with us, and when they came, they came in torrents, turning the track into an instant quagmire of thick mud filling the streams. Often we had to unload our pack ponies to get them through. On one occasion, a section of sappers spent nine hours rescuing a pony from deep mud. It shook itself and ran back in. The girls were incredibly patient. They and the sappers developed a sort of exasperated affection for the ponies. Mud. It caked everything and everybody. Our sweat-soaked clothes rotted on us. Leather equipment grew mold. Even our jungle boots, the best available, began to fall apart. Everything that bites and stings sought us out. To avoid inch-wide centipedes, black scorpions and spiders the size of dinner plates, we put up hammocks for the night with mosquito nets, sometimes in old Indian clearings. There were beautiful stinging caterpillars and ants, some of them an inch long, whose bites hurt like hell for hours. Tim Nicholson's dream had developed some of the qualities of nightmare. Brushing against the foliage, we constantly picked up ticks that, almost unnoticed, buried their teeth into us with such tenacity that they often had to be removed by our medical officer. Vampire bats were particularly cruel to our ponies. But there were idyllic scenes, too. The 
jungle is a living pantry. We ourselves and the members of the Panamanian Guardia Nacional who accompanied us shot game to supplement our excellent compo rations. From this hill, our reconnaissance team had a rare and beautiful view over to another hill with an attractive Spanish name, rechristened by us Heartbreak Hill. Hold in there. Oh, I see. Usually, the recce sections were lucky to see 30 meters ahead, which made compass work difficult. Our beaver flew out to help them with navigation and drop supplies. But first, the pilot had to find us. The gas that we used to inflate these balloons smelt abominably. Uh, Roger, well, use the balloon as your marker to drop onto the balloon, over. The muddy track was beginning to tell on men and vehicles. Another ruddy disco. This was the third differential to go. We had to wait till evening for our regular radio schedule to call up our support base at La Palma. Next day, the Panamanian Air Force, who were most helpful throughout the expedition, brought in a replacement. The rover company had supplied us with spares of all kinds, but the condition of the vehicles was now causing us very serious concern. However, we were able to build excellent gantries for servicing. During our pre-planning period, we asked the British Army's experimental engineering establishment to design and build us multiple purpose interlocking ladders. These were proving a very great success. Made of aluminum alloy, they were strong enough to carry a fully laden Range Rover across the many ravines, as well as providing the deck for our raft. We have calculated since that we used them over 400 times during the expedition. Hang on there! Who's going to give me a potion? Hold it in again, lads. Sit down. Sickness and accidents were inevitable under these conditions. And at one time and another, 30 of us had to be evacuated temporarily or permanently by air or down rivers. When Lance Corporal Bob Phipps was injured by a falling tree, Captain John Richardson, RAMC, strapped him up to be flown to a hospital in Panama. John and his SRN wife, Susie, were constantly and separately moving between camps to look after us all. On one occasion, John had to fly out with 17-year-old Sapper Duffy in a United States Air Force helicopter to save his life. The penicillin he had been giving Duffy for another injury masked the fact that he had acute appendicitis as well. The advance parties were cutting their way ahead, passing through occasional Indian settlements on the headwaters of the tributaries to the river Bayano. The Kuna Indians, descendants of a highly developed culture, distrust the camera and wouldn't allow us to photograph their women who weave this unique molar cloth. The Choco had no inhibitions about our cameras and were happy to sell eggs and bananas to Charles Keyes, our interpreter in Spanish. Members of our scientific party, including Robin Hanbury Tennyson, chairman of Survival International, were making a study of the local population. They thought it essential when the road is built that the 5,000 or so Indians in the area should be guaranteed lands and be insulated from exploitation if they are not to fragment and become a tragic social problem.
Under these severe conditions, so many differentials had broken that at one time we had only two wheels out of eight in operation, one vehicle towing the other. We struggled into a Choco Indian settlement whose inhabitants watched with wonder as Captain Jim Masters, RE, our chief engineer, jacked up this vehicle which had crashed into their jungle. Jim radioed the melancholy news to John Blashford Snell further ahead in the jungle. It looked as though a third major expedition had been defeated by the Darien Gap as John radioed through to base where there were no more spares. The vehicle party settled gloomily to wait while desperate telephone calls went through to the Rover Company in England. The Range Rovers had finally broken down at the River Ipiti on the 4th of February. They'd made only 30 miles in 16 days and there were still more than 200 miles to go. The reconnaissance section hacked their way on, followed by the leading engineers. We'd known that we would meet some of the finest hardwood trees in the world and had carried out some research before acquiring what was said to be the best power saw in Europe, the Swedish Husqvarna. We found it very good indeed. banks were too steep, we graded them, knowing all the time that we were making a track that our Range Rovers might never be able to use. At Torti, we emerged from under the jungle roof to a Panamanian village on an old airstrip and held a race meeting. The expedition's equestrians raced our ponies against the members of the Panamanian Guardia Nacional. Panamanians won the day, and a good time was had by all. At Ipiti, the Range Rover team were still disconsolately drinking cups of tea and cheering themselves with a great deal of merry down cider. Captain Gavin Thompson of the 17th 21st Lancers, using our scheduled evening radio period, kept in touch with our deputy leader, Kelvin Kent, who reported that the Rover Company was as determined as we were not to be defeated and were carrying out tests in England. Our forward base had been moved to La Palma on the Gulf of San Miguel. There, Kelvin worked day and night throughout those three months, acting as our contact with the outside world and running our supply systems with Kay Thompson, our general manager. During the expedition, they sent us out 10 tons of rations, 2,400 cans of beer, 80,000 cigarettes, 15,000 gallons of Golden Eagle petrol, horse fodder, boxes of dynamite and mail, using boats, pack ponies, porters, helicopters and, of course, our beaver. Through February, the advance parties cut their way off reconnoitering a viable route, chopping and cutting a track through the jungle. On the 1st of March, a Panamanian helicopter ended our 25 days wait at Ipiti, flying in new axles, tyres and beer. Jeff Miller, a senior engineer from Rovers, had come out to advise us. Rovers, he said, uh, trying to diagnose our trouble, had driven Range Rovers continuously for four days and nights, struggling in wintry Solihull to simulate the tropical conditions of Darien. At last, they too had managed to break a differential. Working through the night, we had both vehicles ready to cross the river on the next day. We found that our special ladders had an extra facility. They floated. In fact, one nearly got away downstream. Our Choco friends watched us leave. From now, they would probably reckon their calendar from the year the motor cars came. We had replaced our tyres. Jeff Miller from Rovers, who drove with us for a few weeks, thought they'd put too much strain on the vehicles. 
The other particular fault, he said, had been a certain degree of overloading, particularly the load on the roof, which affected the vehicle's centre of gravity. Beginning of March, the column had lengthened to over a hundred miles. The recce section had reached a group of riverside settlements and a track had been partly cleared to just beyond Santa Fe. But the Range Rovers had been six weeks in the jungle. In another six weeks, the mid-April rains would make the Atrato Swamp impassable. To catch up on lost time, Kelvin Kent arranged with the United States Air Force to fly into Santa Fe a second-hand Land Rover that he'd bought in Panama. This started to move ahead in support of the leading engineers section under Ernie Dury. The Range Rovers were making better progress now along the track cut by the advance parties. But the jungle is a versatile enemy. Having failed to defeat us with its late rains, it was falling back on the secondary defense of drought that had failed to check our advance parties. We slaked our thirsts with sugar cane, bought from the Indian settlements, tapped the juice from vines that clung to the trees and filtered water from slimy pools. But we must have been sweating pints a day. When it rained cans of water from heaven, it was more delicious than a pint at the old dog and duck. didn't want the water. After travelling alongside the main party in the early stages, they'd now set up camp near a waterfall on a mountain. Jerry Carter was the geologist. Al Gentry, botanist from Panama, with a Panamanian student friend, was studying the trees and plants in the rainforest. When he couldn't climb to reach his specimens, they were shot down for him by Dr. Philip Burton, ornithologist. He was using frail mist nets to make a collection of birds and bats from the region. Bacchus, entomologist, was studying the insects of the region. While the scientists pursued their task in this demi-paradise, the Range Rovers were moving slowly but steadily. By mid-March, they'd made about 90 miles from Canitas, averaging about four miles a day, with 150 miles or so to go. The advance party of engineers with the Pathfinder Land Rover was about 60 miles ahead, moving into the hilly border region of the Pukuru Heights. Working with them was a party of prisoners who'd been lent to them. They were Colombians held for some reason in a Panamanian jail. The Panamanians had released them to the expedition on the condition that they were delivered to their compatriots over the border, an arrangement that suited all parties. But the advance section had now run into serious trouble. The beaver had broken its tail and couldn't give essential guidance. Several recce sections were sent out, one cutting due south, only to be turned back by very dense jungle and sharp ridges. Others tried to find a way through to the east. Time was running out, and the Land Rover section followed, cutting a track. For ten days, they struggled to get past the mountain barrier. Finally, they were turned back again, and taking a gamble, they drove and rafted up the partly dry bed of the River Tuira. Fairly dry. When our pathfinder met with deep pools, the invaluable raft ferried it through. 
We lost a lot of time, and the Range Rovers were only a couple of days behind them when they drove into Boca Coupe. These small riverside towns are settled by white colonistas who are moving into the undeveloped regions of the area, and by Libres, the black descendants of escaped and freed slaves who have been settling here for 400 years trading on the river. Here at last, the vehicles caught up with the headquarters group as well as with the beer. Since the beaver was out of action, Kelvin Kent had organized a fleet of Piraguas, the small local craft, to deliver supplies to us. Carolyn had walked the whole way through with the ponies, but Rosemary had recently been taken down to base seriously ill with an allergic reaction to a hornet sting. Following the Land Rover, we alternately drove and rafted up the river, the sappers manhandling the raft between pools. We nearly met with another disaster when a Range Rover drove into an unsuspected pool. It was a credit to the vehicle and to the mechanics that within 36 hours it was dried out and on the road again. Did I say road? There was a long, mountainous track ahead, and the rains were due over the Atrato swamp in a fortnight. Fortunately, the recce section found an old smuggler's track, hardly a footpath, about which John Blashford Snell had learned on a quick visit to Panama. On April 9th, the Range Rovers reached the Panama-Colombia frontier, marked only by a plinth called Palo de las Letras. The Land Rover, with the forward sappers, had passed through a week before, and was making its way down through the jungle. Recce sections, led by Richard Summerton, had spent some weeks finding a way through the Atrato swamp. As Tim Nicholson looked out over the swamp on April the 17th, heavy rains were building up. It's an area the size of Wales, formed out of ancient lakes where the two continents of America moved together millions of years ago. For the first section, the expedition moved on the raft along tributaries to the river Atrato. On the main river, the Colombian government had provided a gunboat as headquarters with some servicemen as support. Earlier, there'd been a tragic accident when a small boat carrying a reconnaissance party had capsized in heavy seas off the mouth of the Atrato. Five Colombian servicemen were drowned. Only their officer had survived with Captain Jeremy Groves of the 17th 21st Lancers, the liaison officer. In the tributary, the matted weed had had to be cut with machetes pulled with grapnels, and even where it was entangled with logs, blasted with necklaces of dynamite. There was a foul stench of rotting organic material, and the swamp is reputed to be one of the worst mosquito-infested areas in the world a reputation endorsed by the expedition. Beyond the trees which began to line the stream was endless flat swamp, which will be a major challenge to the engineers of the projected highway. After three days forcing the raft through the weed, the vehicles were able to land on a crust about three to four feet thick above the swamp. Soon the rains would flood its surface of matted vegetation. The expedition had only just made it in time. We were immensely tired. Some of us had lost two or three stone. Our bodies were a mass of bites and our feet rotting with jungle foot. But we were happy to be near the end. And our CBC sound man, who had walked with us all the way, was still pioneering new routes. At last, after 99 days in the jungle and the swamp, we emerged onto a track designed for vehicles. And in a few miles to the bridge at Barranquilito, and the southern half of the Pan-American Highway. It was St. George's Day. Viva Inglaterra! Viva Canada! Viva 
Colombia. The Colombians gave us a great welcome. Not only were we the first vehicles to complete this journey between the two highways, north and south, we were the first contingent of the British Army to fight alongside the Colombians, if only against swamp and jungle, since 600 British and Irish soldiers had fought with Simon Bolivar in the War of Liberation 150 years ago. We were all made freemen of the local town of Chicarodo, fated in the provincial capital, Medellin, and finally carried on a motorcade through the streets of Bogota, the capital of Colombia. John Blashford Snell and the Colombian liaison officer who had accompanied us, Major Alberto Petron, laid a wreath at the feet of Simon Bolivar, the great liberator. And here we parted. While most of us returned pretty exhausted to England, the Range Rover party drove on with Tim Nicholson. They too were very tired. They had only another seven to 8,000 miles or so to go. The speedometer began to move again. The small driving team, led since they emerged from the Atrato Swamp by Jeremy Groves, who had so nearly lost his life there, was often cruising at 100 miles an hour. In the Darien Gap, they'd averaged two and a half miles a day. It wasn't all like that. The late rains had failed to thwart them north of the equator, so the southern hemisphere laid on an early winter in the Andes. Here, the Pan American Highway is often little more than a track. For five days, they searched for a way through the mountains, finding pass after pass blocked by snow. They finally just made it. The last pass was blocked soon after they crossed it. But the dream had come true. When, after 27 weeks, they switched off their engines, the myelometers read 17,018 miles. Thank you for watching. If you haven't already, subscribe and click the notifications bell so you don't miss our weekly videos.